Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's big video which features the contents of this relatively small and light box. Okay, this is maybe uh, half to two-thirds the size and weight of the boxes we're used to receiving. So there's something unusual in here and I can't wait to see it. So, so let's get out the trusty box cutter and see what our sign will, will be for the next couple weeks. And here we have it, what appears to be a very small tweed single-ended amplifier. We'll go into much more detail, of course, in just a second. But before I do, I wanted to say that the uh, person who packed this and shipped it did a very smart thing. They attached a piece of cardboard underneath to protect the circuit from the packing material. Now some people uh, after the amp's been all rebuilt they uh, put packing material in the bottom of the box and then just drop the um, chassis in there and the packing material can come in and push components around and cause short circuits. So I think it's always best if you uh, attach a piece of cardboard to the bottom to completely protect the position of the leads within the circuit. Let's take just a quick glance here at this and it is remarkably original. Um, three tubes, um, single-ended, which would make you think Champ or very early Princeton. And uh, we see here it isn't a Champ because we've got a volume and tone control, uh, get some corrosion on the chrome plate but my lord look at the condition of the chassis of the part that hangs vertically uh, toward the front or speaker side of the cabinet beautiful now let's take a look at the owner's letter uh, he has identified uh, the circuit as being a 5E2 based on what is uh, written on the tube chart in the amp and um, built, uh, he estimates, in July of 1956. It's in a narrow uh, paneled tweed cabinet about 16 inches tall. Now, sadly, somebody has covered the tweed with Tolex, okay? He intends to retweed the cabinet. Uh, also, uh, there's a point here, and he and I have discussed this, uh, the circuit does not strictly correspond to any of the schematics from that era and that's something we can take a look at here in just a few moments um, let's see the previous owner had it for 30 years or so and never changed anything uh, it worked and sounded okay speaker was play, uh, was replaced with a 10 inch on the original baffle um, okay that's they didn't enlarge the hole thank God so he can go back to the original 8 inch speaker on the original baffle. Here's what our assignment is uh, to restore the circuit to good safe working order which will entail um, installation of a, a three wire power cord, uh, testing of all the uh, capacitors and resistors and replacement of the uh, three electrolytic capacitors as well as whatever else is uh, necessary. Um, he wants it to remain as original looking as possible. Clean the face of the chassis if uh, the best I can. Uh, he's asking about transplanting the components into a Mojotone brand new chassis and I have discouraged him from doing that. I think it's even though this does have some uh, definite corrosion and all it's it's original. It's the real thing. And you can still read all the silk screening quite legibly. Uh, he wants to be able to switch between an 8 inch speaker and a 10 inch speaker. My feelings on that are that uh, with the speaker output jack here you can uh, plug in the cabinet speaker, the 8 inch, unplug it and then plug in a speaker cabinet with any configuration of speakers you want. Um, you know, you could have two 12s if you want, but uh, 
as long as the net impedance is 4 ohms. Okay, and um, it wants me to try to figure out what schematic best suits the amp. And, uh, you know, as we've discussed before, um, they're making these things in a garage. Okay, and, and uh, on each, on a certain day, they might run out of a particular components they need, so they'll use slightly different ones. Um, it's really hard to nail down a perfect match on these very early amps with a schematic. To me, the schematics at the time were sort of just to provide guidance, but they weren't adhered to 100% many times. Um, okay, so uh, that's it. Uh, in other words, we just want this jewel to look original and work as well or better than original and um, make the uh, owner proud and as happy as possible. And uh, that's always our mission, so let's get started. Since there seems to be some uncertainty about the exact identification of this circuit, let's take a few moments and look at the schematics of two likely possibilities, the 5E2 and the 5F2 Princeton circuit. Since the amplifier was made according to the tube chart in 1956, it could be either one. The 5E2 came out in May of 55 and the um, 5F2 came out in January of 1956. But as we'll see, the circuit here does not exactly match either of these two very likely possibilities. Both schematics show a filter choke and an 8 ohm at 450 volt reservoir capacitor, whereas the amp that we have before us has no filter choke and the reservoir capacitor is 16 microfarads. Now the 16 microfarad first a cap sounds more like the 5F2A circuit, but it was not uh, created until November of 57, so I would say it's off the table. Okay, one other uh, identifying feature is that the 5E2 has a cathode bypass cap on the first triode, the 5F2 does not, and the amp that we have before us does. So, uh, in my opinion, I believe that what we have here is a 5E2 Princeton circuit. Uh, and I've done some uh, ex exploration on the internet, particularly on Reverb, on eBay and other places where these amplifiers are sold. And I found several other 5E2 Princetons that had the 16 microfarad cap in the reservoir position and no filter choke. I believe that the schematic is not really an accurate representation of how the 5E2 amps were created. I think initially it was probably, uh, it seemed like a great idea to slap a filter choke on there and stick with the 8, 8, and 8 microfarad caps, but when reality uh, reared its ugly head and probably the, when they ran out of filter chokes, uh, they switched to a non-filter choke circuit and they upped the reservoir cap to 16 microfarads to compensate. So. I think what we have here then is a 5E2 uh, Fender Princeton amplifier uh, with modifications that were made at the time of manufacture to probably to lower the manufacturing cost by elimination of the filter choke and uh, increase of the reservoir cap for compensation of, of greater smoothing and I believe that it is uh, very typical of what 5E2 circuits look like back in the 1956 era. Now the speaker is missing from our little Princeton amplifier.
So the owner uh, has asked me what would be the appropriate impedance for a replacement speaker. And rather than just trusting what you can read or guess, I've decided to measure the winding ratio of the output transformer so that uh, we can tell exactly. And to do that, I am using my Variac to feed in uh, a certain amount of AC voltage into the primary of the output transformer and adjusting it upward until I get just about exactly one volt output from the secondary. And this ratio will tell us what the winding ratio and impedance ratio is for the output transformer. It looks like it's going to be 39.8. So uh, let's write that down and then let's proceed to do some math so that we can answer some uh, difficult question. Well with a winding ratio of 39.8 uh, you will square it and we get 1584. That's going to be the impedance ratio and by that I mean if we hook up that output transformer to a 4 ohm speaker the reflected impedance to our output tube will be 6,336 ohms whereas if we connect to an 8 ohm speaker it'll be 12,672 ohms. Now you want the best possible impedance match between your output tubes and your speaker and uh, we see here that uh, what is ideal for a single-ended 6v6 operating at around 275 volts DC is going to be uh, between 6k to 6.5k ohms which shows us that the ideal speaker for this uh, amplifier circuit is a 4 ohm impedance speaker. An 8 ohm uh, speaker will reflect much higher uh, resistance back to the 6v6 and will not be a good match this would degrade the output power and the tone somewhat so uh, we uh, we want to get a 4 ohm speaker for sure looks like it's time to start on our repairs of the Princeton circuit and I think step one should be replacement of the old two wire power cord with a three wire power cord that grounds the chassis the three wire power cord is now uh, installed um, because I wanted to eliminate the jarring visual effect of bright white and bright green wires, I tinted them uh, black, uh, of course keeping track of what color was which, and uh, the green ground wire has been soldered to the chassis. The white wire comes over here to a terminal strip and going into uh, one of the primary leads of the power transformer. The other, uh, the third lead, the black or so-called hot wire came over here to the on-off switch through the fuse and then into the other primary wire of the power transformer. And of course the nasty old uh, death cap has been separated from the circuit. I left it intact for original appearance but uh, it is not electrically connected. Now let's address these three ancient electrolytic filter caps. Uh, since the owner wants me to preserve the original appearance, I will insert brand new electrolytics into these cardboard tubes. Let's get started. The capacitors have been removed. Now let's uh, uncrimp one end of the cardboard tube on each of them and press out the uh, electrolytic capacitor within. You can see where I've uncrimped the end of the cardboard tube and I'm pressing out the uh, aluminum cased 16 microfarad electrolytic cap. The aluminum capacitor has been removed and as you can see from that hemorrhoid right there uh, this was way beyond uh, its shelf life and definitely needed to be replaced. I have a brand new 16 microfarad at 475 volt Sprague Atom that is just slightly too fat to fit inside the tube so I'm going to remove the blue uh, coating and uh, see if I can't get it to slide back in uh, very similarly to the old outdated Astron cap that was 
in there before. Here's the new Sprague Atom going into the old Astron cardboard tube. I put the uh, properties of the capacitor on it and, uh, so there could be no question about uh, its identity. Then just to be sure there could be no confusion, I cut out the specification uh, portion of the blue wrapper and attached it to the underside of the old Astron tube. And here we have what appears to be a Astron Mini Mite 16 microfarad cap that appears to be original but has a brand new uh, Sprague Atom uh, capacitor within the tube. Now I'm testing the internodal resistors. This one's supposed to be 10K and it's uh, what 26% over so I'm going to have to replace that one. Next one is 22K and it's right on the money. And I just happen to have an NOS 10K carbon comp resistor on hand that is exactly the right value. So let's install this jewel. Now it's time to insert brand new 8 microfarad electrolytic caps into the uh, cardboard tubes of these two Astrons. Here's our original Astron Mini Mite 8 microfarad at 450 cap, freshly stuffed with a new MOD 8 microfarad at 475 volt uh, electrolytic, and I put the date that the uh, alteration occurred uh, for future reference. Now it's time to do that same process on this final electrolytic. Our restuffed Astron electrolytics are back in place looking very original. Now let's uh, take a look at the remaining four capacitors. This cathode bypass cap uh, 25 microfarads at 25 volts does not check out properly. It has the wrong capacitance and I think it needs to be replaced. Here's that old Astron 25 at 25 uh, cathode bypass cap. It's been restuffed with a brand new 25 at 50 volt electrolytic. Now this final cathode bypass cap, um, I've never tried to restuff one of this small diameter, but it looks like it really needs it because look at all the electrolytes spilling out the end. So let's see if we can get this tube um, uncrimped and get that uh, aluminum body capacitor out of the center of the tube. That was not easy at all. The, uh, the end was so tightly crimped and the cardboard so stiff and old that it preferred to actually tear and shred rather than uncrimp. But I do have the aluminum uh, cap out and let's see if we can't come up with a workable uh, result here uh, by stuffing this with a brand new 25 microfarad at 50 volt electrolytic cathode bypass cap. I'm trying to stuff in the heavy foam disc that will take up the uh, space here, the empty space left by the tiny little mod uh, 25 microfarad at 50 volt cap. Positive end is finished, looks pretty good. Now this poor frayed negative end uh, needs to have the foam installed and then uh, whatever I can do to recrimp it. Here's what I'm using to take up the slack and the little cardboard tube. I've got uh, some of this real high density uh, packing foam and I'm cutting down making like a little cylinder of it that will go in the end, take up the slack and allow the lead to pass through the center. Well there you have the end product. I think it looks a lot better than I expected it would and now I uh, can install it. There's the completed eyelet board on the 5F2 Princeton. If it looks to you like I haven't even started on it yet, well that's the highest compliment you could pay. Um, now that all of the electrolytics have been replaced, uh, I'm going to go ahead and finish up uh, some testing and then plug in the amp and uh, under full operating voltage check for leakage in the two coupling caps and that will be the final um, 
step in the rejuvenation of this uh, ancient circuit. And let's pray that these check out at that time because I can't uh, restuff these. Uh, we're stuck with whatever substitute I have to put in place. So let's hope I don't have to. Before I put in the tubes and test the coupling caps, I used some of McGuire's cleaner wax on that really uh, corroded uh, control panel. And although there's still some corrosion, it sure came out nice. So I recommend this. It didn't remove the uh, white uh, screen printing and it did take out a bunch of the corrosion. I plugged in the three tubes that came with the Princeton. They all appear to be original RCA tubes. I've plugged the amp itself into the current limiter. I've connected a shop speaker to the speaker output and the Eurotubes probe is in series with the five uh, I'm sorry 6v6 now it's time to turn on the amp and see if it works and if so uh, what our bias is like and then we can proceed to test for leakage on the two coupling caps we'll flip the on switch and we see that our pilot lights out for safety's sake, I'm going to replace that before I continue. Okay, I replace the bulb and pilot light works. Let's watch and see what our plate voltage and plate current are for our 6V6. And it looks like it's going to be, what, a shade over 10 watts, which is right on the money so that appears to be just fine um, obviously our 5Y3 is working uh, let's see about the 12AX7 we'll crank up the volume a little bit and short the input jack sounds like we got good, good volume I also uh, tested the tone control and it is ranging between uh, strong treble and strong bass so I think we're in pretty good shape now it's time to check uh, for leakage in our two coupling caps of course before doing anything with the circuit now that it's been turned on I'm going to go through and discharge each of the filter caps so that there is no uh, high voltage remaining in the circuit. We'll start with the right hand coupling cap. Uh, this end of it here goes to the plate of the uh, one of the triodes of the 12AX7 and uh, the uh, end down here goes to the grid of the 6V6. So uh, we're going to pull this end loose from the eyelet board and check it uh, for any DC leakage to see if the DC is getting through our coupling cap and therefore uh, putting an incorrect charge on the grid of the 6V6. The grid end of the coupling cap has been lifted from the circuit and connected to one of my probes to the DC voltmeter and the other probe has gone to ground. Now let's uh, plug in the amp, turn it on, and see if there's any DC uh, showing up at this, uh, on this lead from our coupling cap. And very sadly, there is definitely DC voltage showing up on that end uh, to the tune of about 12.4 volts, which is a lot of leakage. So much as I hate to say it, that coupling cap will have to be replaced. Alright, so far we've tested that coupling cap and found it to be leaky. Now let's look at the coupling cap that protects the uh, volume and tone controls uh, from the plate voltage of the first triode of the 12AX7. I have uh, lifted that end out of the circuit and let's repeat the same test that we did for the right hand coupling cap. And again, sadly, it appears we have 5 volts of DC showing up on the distal lead of that coupling cap, which means that it is applying 5 volts of DC to 
our uh, volume control, which can make it scratchy and is just not right. So uh, I'm gutted here, as the British would say, but uh, it looks like both of the coupling caps will have to be replaced, which is kind of sad because I'm trying to preserve at all costs the originality of the appearance of the circuit, and I cannot stuff the coupling caps, so uh, we're going to have to sacrifice some of that appearance um, in uh, return for a good, reliable, and proper performance of the circuit. Now I've installed a Sprague orange drop in place of the yellow Astron and uh, we see that there is no DC at all showing up on the distal lead. Let's repeat that uh, with this second uh, replacement uh, couple, uh, coupling cap right here beside it. I'm now measuring for leakage on the second of the two coupling caps and we see that there is no measurable DC present on the distal lead. Thus, uh, we've had to replace both of the uh, original yellow Astron coupling caps. And let me just say it's not very unusual to have to do that. Yellow Astrons have a lousy reputation. Blue Astrons have a fabulous reputation. I do not understand why that's the case. I've never dissected one of these, uh, but anyway, uh, these are going to go into the uh, junk envelope to be returned to the owner, and the app will continue as you see it. Okay, it would appear that our repairs are completed. We have a, a proper uh, cathode bias level for a 6v6, good volume, proper tone control, quiet controls, uh, they don't scratch and uh, now we're ready uh, for an audio demonstration. If we can get uh, Jack and Ollie tuned up and sobered off of catnip and ready to play. Fire. Uh, the original tubes are in place. The amplifier is connected to the 12-inch uh, Jensen Shop speaker uh, that is being monitored by the uh, SM57 micro. And the guitar for today's festivities is the uh, 64, this is an original, not a reissue, uh, SG Junior. These are the settings we'll be using. Volume is set at uh, around 3.5 to 4 out of 12. And the tone is at about 10.5 out of 12. I have found by trial and error that shifting to the uh, treble side of the tone control uh, gave us the best clarity and I think the best tone.
Well, I guess that about does it for this video on the mighty 1956 5 E2 Princeton uh, in a narrow panel tweed cabinet. I'd like to take a few moments to thank our PayPal contributors and our Patreon patrons for keeping us on the air uh, and advertising free. Without their generous support of our channel, I can assure you that these videos would not be available. Should any of you out there in YouTube land decide you'd uh, like to uh, join them in supporting our channel, I will put links in the video description which will enable you to do so. I hope you enjoyed the video and all the technical steps that we took and uh, bringing this little amp up to fully functional status. I also hope that you will stay tuned and join us in our future video productions. Uh, until then, uh, we'll see you. Thanks so much for watching. Bye for now.